Good morning. My name is Brandon Noble, and it's my privilege this morning to read the biblical scripture that is going to be the text for Mickey's sermon. It's taken from 1 Samuel. The chapter is chapter 19. And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan, sorry, and Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you. And because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took the life in, in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine. And the Lord worked a great salvation for all of Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. And there was a war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow, so that they should flee before him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing the lyre. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he eluded Saul so that he struck the, stuck the spear into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him, that he might kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, told him, If you do not escape with your life tonight, to no, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through the window, and he fled away and escaped. And Michal took an image and laid it on the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair at its head and covered it with clothes. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. Then Saul sent messengers to see David saying, bring him up to me in the bed and I will kill him. And then the messengers came in and behold, the image was in the bed and with a pillow of goat's hair at his head. Saul said to Michal, why have you deceived me thus, and let my enemy go, so that he has escaped? And Michal said, answered Saul, and he said to me, Let me go, why should I kill you? Now David fled and escaped, and he came to Samuel at Ramah, and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and lived in Naoth. And it was told Saul, Behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. And then Saul sent messengers to take David when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing his head over them. The Spirit of God had come upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. When it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they also prophesied. And then Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they also prophesied. Then he, said, he himself went to Ramah and came to the great wall that is in Seku. He said, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they are at Naoth and Ramah. And he went there to Naoth and Ramah, and the Spirit of God came upon him also. And as he went, he prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah. And he too stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied before Samuel and lay naked all that day and all that night. Thus it was said, Is Saul among the prophets? I had an opportunity to go to an annual meeting I go to, and I've gone to for over 20 years now, called the Evangelical Theological Society. It's a little nerdy, to be honest. Uh, 2,600 people were there this year. Most of them are professors teaching Bible, theology, ministerial classes. There are some pastors there, and they do that nerdy thing where they don't just give lectures to one another, they read papers which sounds really boring, but because it's the precision of the discussion and the topic, and much of what comes out of there turns into books and commentaries and articles and things like that. But there was a special moment on Wednesday night 
There's a special address by this year's president, and this year's president is a man who is uh, later in life and having many health issues, and he is a formidable man. He has written, get this, over 60 books, and he's not yet 80, which means he's written on average one book every 18 months, if you include from when he was born. Now that's pretty early. Uh, that's a lot of books. Just imagine how many people have read that many books, uh, but, but, but written over 60 books. And he has been a professor. He was a professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, where I studied as well for seminary. And so at one point, when he was being introduced, you have people at this conference from all over the world. Like after this meeting, I literally met with a guy from Australia for an hour and a half. So you have all these people from all over the planet that gather in the U.S. once a year for these meetings of people in our tradition who take the Bible seriously, take Christ and the gospel seriously, and are trying to minister theologically and biblically to the church. And the, 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 the person introducing this speaker asked all of his students over 40 plus years of ministry to stand, me of course being one of them, and you just see this horde of people stand from all over the world. African countries, European countries, missionaries, pastors, Bible teachers, and seminaries and colleges. And it was just kind of a powerful display of the faithfulness of this one man. And he lectured for an hour just on the phrase, holy, holy, holy. Again, sounds a little nerdy, but this man elucidates the Bible. It just makes it come alive. And he showed how from the beginning to the end of Scripture, that phrase, holy, 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 describes not only our identity in God, but even the mission of the church. And at the end of this, this gathering of 2,600 people, he had us all stand and properly sing, holy, holy, holy. And he heard all these voices, like an, an a cappella choir singing, with this now frail man who was just a force of theological knowledge and teaching for decades, leading us and singing. And I'm, I'm thinking, we're in Denver, Colorado. We have all these servers waiting, pouring coffee and water because it was a dinner gathering. And we're in this city with pubs and bars and restaurants all around and a busy city active. And in the middle of that is this gathering of 2,600 Christians. In the middle of that in this evening is hundreds of us gathered singing, holy, holy, holy. And I'm like, what do the waiters think? or the servers, or the hotel staff, or the scores of volunteers involved in this activity, or just the people in the city when, when literally a couple thousand evangelicals plop in, buying books and reading papers to one another, praying together. What did they think? That maybe looked a little strange. I wondered what the server serving the table I was sitting at was thinking as we were talking and praying and exhorting one another in different ways. What's it like to be in but not of the world? Like, what's that look like? This text actually gives us a fascinating look at that tension, that, that pull of allegiances, right? Where we have allegiances to things in this world, but we have allegiance to God. In fact, you'll see, and I even broke the notes up into three parts, there are three characters in this story that give us a glimpse of what it looks like to love the things of this world in a proper way, but to ultimately seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And those three characters are Jonathan, the son of Saul, Michal, the wife, the daughter of Saul, and the wife of David. And then, of course, that third character, interestingly, is God himself. And in each of these examples, these heroic examples, David is saved. His life is threatened. And each time David is miraculously, or just because of the faithfulness of individuals, his life is preserved. And we get to watch and see. In this story, even though Saul and David are generally the main characters of this book, it is Jonathan, Michal, and God who become the characters we're supposed to watch. Let me remind you of the context. Saul no longer hides his hatred of David or his intentions to kill him. He had tried. He, he had wanted him to die by natural means. He even gave his daughter to David. 
thinking that that, this is what chapter 18 taught us, that that would cause the Philistines to just put him down. Like, think about that. Your daughter's just a pawn so that you can make your political moves effective. But it didn't work. So now Saul thinks, I'm not hiding this. I'm not playing the game anymore. So look at, he says in verse 1, Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, and told them that they should kill David. Imagine your dad saying that to you. But put it in a larger context, at least functionally, not in God's order, but at least functionally, that is still the king speaking. Do you you disobey your dad? Do you disobey your king? Michal is going to have the same challenge set before her, this time her pitting her herself, her father against her husband. And then ultimately, that last example, God intervenes himself. This chapter depicts for us ways we can live in the world in which we are surrounded with evil people and evil systems of power, and yet still seek to honor and pursue what God desires, to love, to pursue justice, to pursue human flourishing, ultimately the common good. We could even say it this way. How do we show allegiance to something we love and are deeply connected to and yet still honor God and his revealed will? This isn't just a Bible thing. This is us. How do we love our country and have allegiance to our country and yet seek first the kingdom of God? How do we do that? You feel that dual allegiance? In this story, we get an example of what that looks like. A son and a daughter to a father, yet a friend, Jonathan, to the true king, and a wife to her husband. This text shows us how we can honor God and seek the good of others, even with conflicted allegiances. Let's, let's pray before we look at the text. Father, minister to us through your word. Help us to see how a Christian can pursue the good of others even in a world filled with sinful people and sinful systems. Help us to watch and see the ways that you preserve the life of David through those who love him and ultimately love you who are caught in the middle of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first example is Jonathan, verses 1 to 7. And I think this text is teaching us that we can pursue the good of others by applying God's provision of goodness and truth. Let me explain. Saul had hoped that David's marriage to Michal would cause the end of him, but it didn't work. Without shame or embarrassment, seemingly, Saul told his son Jonathan to kill David. Jonathan absolutely defies his father's wishes. Put that in context. That's a big risky move. Like you're pit against your friend who you love. Again, look, look at the end of verse 1. But Jonathan, Saul, Saul's son, delighted much in David. Yet the earlier part of verse 1, Jonathan was the son of Saul. So what do you do? Your father just told you to do something you can't do. But he is both your father and your king. What do you do? Well, Jonathan did two things. First, he got involved in the situation by serving as an intermediary between his father and David. He jumped in. He addressed it. He didn't cower from it. He carefully and winsomely pursued the best in the situation. Brothers and sisters, too many Christians spiritualize their Christian lives and lock them in a sanctuary. God did not create you to worship and serve him only during a couple hours on Sunday morning. He designed you, the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, based upon the original creation account, to be the prophets, priests, and kings of creation. Do you realize that's what you created to be? A lot of times when we think of the book of Genesis, especially Genesis 1 and 2, we think of the how question. Like, how did he make the world? When in reality, the biggest question those verses are trying to answer is what? What did God make you to be and to do? And how did he make you to function? He designed you to be carrying the derived authority of the king and to be his vice regents in all of creation. 
prophets who declare that God is good and worship Him in all you do. Priests to be ministering over God's creation and caring for people. And kings to be administrating and cultivating God's creation. When you think of Genesis 1 and 2 that way, that all of a sudden allows your Monday to Friday job to be part of your Christian life. Not just church or a Bible study. So not just your soul, but your body belongs to God and your Christianity. In Christ, we are able to display for the world what it means to be truly human. Do you think of Christianity that way? Or do you have this spiritual and physical divide where you kind of separate the two? Where the Christianity is like a, 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 this lovely life insurance. You've got, hey, you've, got your, your, you've got your car insurance, you've got your house insurance, and you've got your soul insurance. You're good to go. And the rest of your life seems disconnected from those things. That's, that's not the Christianity the Bible displays and announces. Think of it this way. Every person who is united to Christ, is finally reconnected to their maker and creator. That means that if people are not Christians, they are literally separated from their creator. Creation and creator are like divorced. Like they don't know who they are. They don't have God's spirit as a presence with them. Their entire life is disoriented. Is it any wonder that you can look at the world in which we live and see all of these disordered loves craving the wrong things? Because they aren't united to their creator. Christians alone are able to know what it means to be truly human, to know and love their creator to love one another as family and to love their neighbor. And we're able to live then as creatures in God's creation with greater clarity and purpose. All you do is for the glory of God. We seek the common good and human flourishing in everything. Teaching children how to read in school. Serving on a county board. Growing crops that feed our neighbors. Running a business that serves employees well and benefits the community. Beautifying our yards, our homes, our neighborhoods as part of the cultivation of creation. And loving people deeply and generously because we know who made them and what God's purpose for them truly is. Now you tell me what part of your day does Christianity therefore not touch? And if you just think it's like, well, that's what I do Sunday morning, but Monday is totally different, then you, you, you've misunderstood. Sunday you might be priestly ministering in a certain way, but by Monday morning, kingly and prophetically living this out, cultivating God's creation in all that you do as accountants, as teachers, as moms or dads, or whatever, whatever that role is, that's what Christianity looks like. So here Jonathan has this moment where he hears his dad speak and knows that that is not what is good and true for any of them. Not just David, but even for his father. So listen to how he tries to persuade his dad with what is good and true in verses 4 to 6. Verse 4 says, And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul his father. And he says this, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand and he struck down the Philistine and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. And you saw and rejoiced. Notice how he's trying to make an argument. See, Father, what is right and good. Look what is true. He asks this question at the end of verse 5. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan and swears not to kill him even though he doesn't keep that promise. There was no guarantee that this, this would convince Saul or overpower his evil intentions, but in this case it did. But but at times, like Jonathan, Christians are wise to take what is good and true and help the world see it, to be winsome. There's no guarantee to work. The world doesn't even know what might be good and true. Help the world see it. This is what is good. You were made to function this way. This is how we should treat life. 
See it for what it is. We had a neighbor on our street uh, a few years back, right, right after the 2020 election, that put up a Confederate flag right outside his house. In fact, it was right over the street on a, on a tree trunk that had been cut down and uh, was right there. And we live on a street right across from Ledgewood and Stone Creek Elementary School. So every day you've got all these parents and young kids driving by. And there is this Confederate flag there on a, a, a school day. And I come home and my kids, I didn't see it. And my kids say, Did, there's a Confederate flag down the road at a neighbor's house. I'm like, seriously? So I just, I'm going to go talk to him. I'm like, what are you going to say to him? I said, well, I just, he's my, I'm just going to talk to my neighbor. So I walk down and talk to my neighbor and an older, older gentleman, and he's extremely conservative to the point of like, I'll give you an example, like Fox News is crazy liberal. Uh, doesn't watch anything. He's got real specific materials that he reads. Uh, and, and several times stated to me that I haven't read enough and I clearly don't know anything. And I, so, I mean, and it, 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 you know, for him, the Confederate flag symbolized nothing of what most people would think, arguably, or historians. For him, it was a sign of just rebellion. So, like, you pull it up when you disagree with something. Like, I guess if the Bears lose and there was a bad call, you'd pull it up. I don't know. But ultimately, it was just a sign of rebellion. And so, this is, what, this is all I said. Because, I mean, I know we weren't going we to debate history or context or all the negative reality is that flag, for him it simply meant rebellion. And, and I understood that. And he was convinced that I, I didn't understand my position. But again, it was a cordial talk. There was no yelling. It was very friendly. But, but I said to him at one point, I said, well, because he goes to a, a, a separatistic, very conservative church in our area. And he goes, and I said to him like this, I said, what if you knew that nobody driving by understood. Let's just say you're right, your view of what the flag means. What if nobody understood that view? The only thing they saw when they saw that flag was hate and racism and a whole lot of ugly things in our nation's history. He goes, oh, I, I can imagine they'd be upset. He goes, that makes sense. I go, what do you mean? Well, but I've been cussed out all day long and given a lot of individual fingers along the way. I said, I'm not surprised. And I said, you got a bunch of young kids driving by looking at a flag. That maybe, let's just assume you might be right, but they don't know that you're right. They have a totally different view. And if you're called to love your neighbor, is that loving them? He's like, you know what? It wouldn't be. What do you think I should do? He asked me that question. I said, if it was me, I'd take down the flag. He says, all right, I'll do it right away. And within 15 minutes, he took the flag down. Now, he and I didn't have to agree on the history of the Confederate flag or all the things that it symbolizes, but notice we could find some common ground to pursue what is good and right and true. Christians, we're called to live that way, to pursue human flourishing, to pursue justice and peace and love. Jonathan displays that for us in this incidence with his father. The second scene is involving Michal, David's wife. Now, I'm not going to read verses 8 to 10. Randa read those for us. But you'll notice real quick that things go bad. Saul is again, that, that language in verse 9 is not like a demonic spirit, but just judgment from God. That's an idiom in the Hebrew that harmful spirit. This is God's continued judgment on Saul. He's not responding well, and he tries to take David's life. Saul sought to pin David to the wall with his spear, but he eluded Saul, and David fled and escaped that night. Now look at verse 11. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him that he might kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, told him. Now, how did she even know about this? How did she find out? How was she made aware? Maybe because you're the king's daughter, you just, the servants show up, you just ask them, tell me why you're here, and they told her. Now, just, just a side note, I think we, we think of love and romance between a husband and a wife and leave and cleave. In the ancient world, uh, 
when a daughter from a king was given to another man, it was always political, and it was, they were never united with their husband in heart and mind. So if England would give, the king of England would give his daughter to the king of France for the son of the king of France to marry, the whole purpose was that so the king of England could get information on France on benefit of England. The woman never felt like, well, this is my new family, and I'm going to, it was always a marriage of politicking. So Saul would just assume, and maybe even the servants, that she can be told anything. She actually may want her husband to die. She realizes this is all the political move. She's a pawn in this. But that's actually not the case. Similar to Jonathan, right, who instead of claiming the right to the throne as the descendant next in line, when God chose David, what did he do? He deferred to David. Here's Michal who's being used as a pawn by her father, Instead of siding with her dad, she has affection for David and defends his life. The text says, Michal, end of verse 11, told him, if you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through the window. I thought, man, if I was on the second story, my wife was letting me down from the window, I'd be dead. I just, she would just probably just say, you're going to just have to jump. Fair enough. But maybe David was smaller. He let David down through the window, but he, and he fled and escaped. Now, now here's an interesting scenario of deception and trickery that we need to know in 13 to 17. Michal took an image. That, that's a family idol. So notice you've got these covenant people of God who are they're part of the covenant. Like they're, they're meant to be, for, for all intents and purposes, these are Christian people. And yet they've totally adopted cultural practices like idolatry. Now the Bible, the Bible just, just is not being prescriptive in that. It's being descriptive. But they, they take an idol and she puts the idol in the bed with some goat's hair, like a Ferris Bueller moment to make it look like somebody's in the bed sick. Now think about this though. The idol would have actually been a natural thing because like a rabbit's foot or a special penny or rosary beads around a rear view mirror when you're driving, it would have been like a good luck charm or a healing element. So in the ancient world, they believed that these idols had sacred power. So when someone was sick, they might lay the idol near the bed anyway. So it's brilliantly deceptive. It looks just like a normal practice and a big hump in the bed under the blanket. And when the guards come in to kill him, she can say, well, he's sick. And then they say, I'm not going to kill a sick guy. So they leave. Well, that's not even enough for Saul. So when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. Then Saul sent the messengers to see David saying, just carry the bed. Bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. Do you feel the hate in Saul? And when the messengers came in, behold, the image was in the bed with the pillow of goat's hair at its head. So here's Saul, the king, and the father of Michal comes to her and says, why have you deceived me and let my enemy get go so that he has escaped? And look what Michal says at the end of verse 17. He said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? She lies. She says that David was going to kill her. See, Michal used the gods of the culture and the God of her father, his hate of David, against him. The text doesn't moralize the actions of Michal, doesn't even say it's right or wrong. In fact, to be honest with you, both Jonathan and Michal are painted as heroes, whether or not they did it the way God would have approved. How do we handle this deception and blatant lying? I don't think the answer is simply in assuming it's the lesser of two evils or that a crisis moment allows for different morals. In one sense, the Bible simply does not answer this question with any clarity. We could qualify and say the Bible does not approve this, like obviously it wouldn't approve an idol in the house. Yet it is placed in this text in a positive way. I think the solution is revealed by the use of the idol and the deceptive plotting. Michal understands the idolatry and deception of her father and uses it against him. Like a charging bull 
Mikel simply moves to the side and lets the beast's momentum become his own ruin. Interestingly, David talks about this incident in Psalm 59. And in verses 11 through 13, he says these words. He talks about the Lord shielding him, protecting him from his enemies, and then he asks for true justice and judgment. He says this, In your might to the Lord, uproot them and bring them down. For the sins of their mouths and the words of the lips, let them be caught in their pride. Let, like, let their own sin trap them for their destruction. For the curses and lies they utter, consume them in your wrath. Then it will be known to the ends of the earth that God rules over Jacob. Like how, do, how do we apply the response of Michal and even her deception? First, this teaches us to see how the world's idols will be its downfall. We, we should understand the lure of pleasure, power, and plenty. We, we feel that. We all are just discipled by our culture to love pleasure, to seek power, even if power doesn't mean you're the president of the United States, but you've got all the money you need. You don't have to worry about anything. You've got no cause for concern. You can control your world. And of course, plenty. We are literally catechized to be consumers. Like know that about our world. We know that about ourselves as disciples, but we know that about our world, our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers, our students in class with us. But this text also teaches us to live in the world with shrewdness. Since we know the backstory, sin, and are invited to graciously pursue the common good in the midst of evildoers. If Jonathan was portrayed as being winsome in this tearing of allegiances, Mikel is displayed as being wise. Now she navigates all of the world's lure of power and pleasure and plenty to pursue what God would deem would be right and good. This last example is the most extreme, and instead of the character being a human, Jonathan or Mikael, the actual character is God. Here's the story. David, this is the last section in your text, verses 18 to the end of the chapter. David flees again. And he goes to where Samuel is with prophets and worship. And ultimately, he is with the people of God, ministering. And Saul found out where he was and he sent messengers. Look at verse 20. He sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing his head over them, the Spirit of God came upon Saul's messengers and they also prophesied. So picture this scene, right? They're, they're, it's worship. They're worshiping. And here come these soldiers, guards from the king coming to get David. And as they approach, almost like a force field, the same Spirit facilitating the worship of God there overtook these messengers and they just began to worship. When it was said, look at verse 21, when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers. Guess what happened? Same thing. Finally, Saul said, forget this, I'm going myself. So he came, found out where they were. The king arrives. Look at verse 23. And he went there to Niot in Ramah, Here's Saul, and the Spirit of God came upon him also. And as he went, he prophesied until he came. Verse 24, and this is like the junior hires in the room giggle at this little version here, but I want to explain it to you why the Bible includes this. And he stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied before Samuel and lay naked all day and night. Now that is a strange way to end a chapter. But let me explain it to you. The nakedness of Saul might seem a little strange or silly, but think about it this way. Unlike Jonathan, who when God said David is to be king, what did he do? He took off his royal garb, 
probably royal bracelets, royal scepters, and he personally gave them to David. Saul is holding on to them. He wants to be king. So God was going to so shame and humiliate this evildoer that God personally stripped him of his royal robes, put him in a posture of worship and humiliation. Because as Scripture says elsewhere, at the name of Christ, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hence the surprise saying among the people, is Saul also among the prophets? Because it looks like he's actually worshiping and following God, when in reality, God is miraculously working in him. Now, no human wisdom or shrewdness can orchestrate God's unique power to minister in this world. But when God does do miraculous things, and he does, we should support it and seek to align ourselves to what God is doing. Let me give an analogy of this as we move to close. I don't know if you've read the book, The Hiding Place. Totally recommend if you haven't, especially to our young people, be a good read over Christmas break. And I know what you're saying, Christmas break, I don't do any books. Well, fair enough, I get it. Shame on you. But beyond that, The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom is one of the most exciting books you could read. If you don't know the story, she was born in Holland in 1892. Her father, Casper Ten Boom, was a watchmaker. She lived with her father, two sisters, and brother in a house on the corner of a street of Harlem, which is a suburb of Amsterdam. Laura and I had a trip to Am- just north of Amsterdam on the way back to the airport. This is now several years ago. We actually got to tour Corey Ten Boom's house. They lived in the upstairs. The downstairs was where her father, Casper, had a watchmaking shop. On February 28, 1944, a neighbor told the Nazi police that the Ten Boom family was hiding Jews. When the police raided the home, they did not find anyone hiding there because Corey had a secret double wall in her bedroom. Six Jews were hiding inside, and they were not found. Even so, the Nazis arrested Corey, her sister Betsy, and their aging father, Casper. They were sent far away to a prison camp. This book, The Hiding Place, if you haven't read it, it tells that story. It is phenomenal. Read it together as a family. After a horrific experience in a concentration camp, imagine that, which included not only the death of her father, just a mere few days after they got there, but also also the death of her sister. At the end of December, the doctors cleared Corey for release. She was given back all her possessions with which she'd been arrested, and on New Year's Day 1945, she was placed on a train for Berlin. Now get this. Corey Ten Boom, after the war and years later, found out that her release had actually been a clerical mistake. They put her on the wrong list. The entire group, the entire dorm that she was part of at Ravensbrück concentration camp, within a hundred hours of her departure, was sent to the gas chamber and killed. Now why? Maybe she asked that. Why did she Get saved by the gracious power of God. It wasn't some winsome person in some clerical office just changing names. This was the miraculous grace of God. Brothers and sisters, as, as, as sons and daughters of the Creator King, and disciples of King Jesus, Sometimes you will need to be winsome to help the world see what is right and good and true. Remember, you're not just a Christian on Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening small group or or one. You're a Christian Monday morning at work. A prophet, priest, and king with derived authority from the Creator Himself. Jesus isn't just your Savior giving you life insurance. He's your Lord owning your life. Sometimes you need to be winsome Telling the world of God's 
goodness and truth and pursuing what is good for your neighbor and one another. Sometimes you need to be shrewd or wise, knowing the world's propensity for idolatry and pursuing what God would be honored by. And sometimes it's out of your control. And you need to trust in God's power and provision. So be ready to respond to whatever God may do in your midst, even if it's not as extreme as a concentration camp at the tail end of 1944. As the psalmist states, as David himself prays, let it be known to the ends of the earth that God rules. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word which ministers to us and guides us. Thank you for the truth of the gospel. Help us to be winsome with what is good and true and declaring that in the culture in which we live. Help us to be wise as we navigate this pull of allegiances, yet seeking the good of others as we seek to honor God. And Father, help us to know and believe that not just in the time of Corey Ten Boom, but even in our day, sometimes you just do miraculous things. Exalting your goodness and grace, help us to see it and respond to it appropriately. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters that they would leave this place remembering what was declared in the beginning of the biblical story, that now in Christ they are vice regents of the King prophets in a world that need to know about Christ, priests ministering God's common and special grace to the people in their lives, and kings who are cultivating creation with the skill of their hands and the knowledge of their minds and the resources that you've given to them. Help them to live winsomely and wisely and trusting in your providence this week and henceforth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.